Um, I just want to say thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the Crafton America Center for our virtual walkthrough of the exhibition Here Now, Contemporary Narrative and Form in the You Know Me. Um, today with us, we have guest curators Nikki Lewis and Katie Queen. Um, before we begin, I just want to thank uh, these programs are brought to you with support in part by the Department of Cultural Affairs Los Angeles and the California Arts Council. Uh, I just also want to mention that the virtual galleries of Here Now and our other exhibition, A Humble Legacy, are available on craftinamerica.org. And then please check back in the coming weeks for more offerings. And please join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. for our Sunday Sound Streams, a series of digital concerts uh, slash performances. And you can visit craftinamerica.org for more info. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to the guest curators, Nikki Lewis and Katie Queen. Nikki Lewis is a Los Angeles-based ceramic artist and educator. She's been working in ceramics for 24 years. Lewis holds an undergraduate degree from the Kansas City Art Institute in Kansas City, Missouri. In 2004, Lewis earned a master's degree in ceramics from the University of California, Los Angeles. She is a professor of ceramic art at Mount San Antonio College, where she oversees the ceramic program. Lewis also pursues an active studio practice and exhibits her work. Katie Queen is a Los Angeles-based artist and educator working in play for the last 25 years. Queen also attended the Kansas City Art Institute and earned a degree in ceramics. At the KCAI, she, in 1997, she met, met Lewis and the two have been friends and collaborator, collaborators for the past 23 years, which includes curatorial projects and lectures. Queen earned her master's degree from the University of Colorado Boulder. Katie is Associate Professor of Art at the Los Angeles Valley College, where she oversees the ceramic department and teaches two-dimensional design and color theory courses. She also pursues an active studio practice, working both in sculptural and functional ceramics, and exhibits her work nationally. And without further ado, Nikki Lewis and Katie Queen. Hi. Yay, we're so happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for yeah. being part of this with us. It's been a journey, and it's been great. Yeah, it's been a long journey. Yeah. It's been like two years in the making, <laughs> especially since COVID hit and it's goes stretched out. But we really want to thank the Craft in America Center for um, all, you know, just, it's just been a really awesome experience. We want to thank um, Emily Zayden, who is the head curator director. Um, and director of the, um, the center. And we also want to thank Alex Miller, who introduced us. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. Carol Sobion, who created Craft in America, and all the artists, too. You want to yeah, say the name of the um, artists? Uh, I would like to thank, you know, Candice Meth and, um, you know, Liz uh, Huckacek and... Who else do we have on there? We have, we have Kevin, Kevin Snipes. Snipes. We want to thank Amy Smith, Leslie McAnelly. Shoko Teramoya. Shoko. Yeah. Can't mm -hmm. forget Shoko. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Jeff Ostrike. Jeff Ostrike as well. Mm -hmm. And just to say thank Ashley you. Ashley Bevington, Ashley our Bevington. artists. Yeah, and thank just, you. Yeah, we're just, we're mm -hmm. so thrilled for the invitational um, to have you guys come in and be part of this with us and to just pull it together, even though we were in a pandemic and some people were, um, you know, they, they lost their studios, they lost where they were living and they just, everybody pulled through and it's just been fantastic. So thanks everybody. Oh, and I'm Nikki. Oh yeah. Katie. This is Katie. <laughs> just so I know. And we also wanted to say that, um, Katie and I have been, quarantining together yeah. sort of since um the beginning of quarantining so we've been doing this on purpose and diligently responsibly so, yeah. so we can be together today in order to present together because we thought it would be very um difficult to snap back and forth between the zoom so we've been really careful about that and we just um, and we don't want it to be triggering for anyone that we yeah. are we are taking it seriously and it's a conscious de yeah. decision. So we've been really careful about it and and just wanted to express that yeah. to everybody. So. And then so the way that we're planning to set up the Zoom is you know we're going to chat now and we're going to do a slideshow and we're mm -hmm. going to go through uh, the work and talk about the artist's work, the concept of the show, and how we kind of came to this idea and how we collaborated with Craft in America. And then we would like to. Um, in the end have 
time for any Q and A. Like if you guys have questions for us, we really want to save those till the end. And then uh, to be able to use the space. So Alex is in the center right now for us. Thank you, Alex. And he's going to go around and, you know, do a live kind of Broadcast, video broadcasting yeah. for, for those questions at the end. So mm -hmm. um, let's just get started. Yeah, we got to share. Okay. Uh -huh. So give us a second. We're going to share our, our lecture. Yeah, and slideshow. Thank you, babe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yay, here we go. Um, so um, first to start off with, so Nick and I. Oh, sorry, it's kind of going ahead. <laughs> is it uh, is it timed? Yeah. Wait a minute. Let me yeah, pause yeah. it. Is it paused? Yeah. It's okay. Paused. <laughs> nope. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, everyone. Uh, so we want to start to talk first and foremost about how we came up with the concept of this exhibition. We plan to, in a minute, to talk about the history of You Know Me, so bear with us while we first <laughs> kind of tone into just where we kind of even came up with this. Yeah. So um, Nikki and I, two years ago during um, Portland, we, Portland NSICA. NSICA, which is, for those of you who don't know what NSICA is, it's a, a conference that takes place every year in different parts of the country to where ceramic artists come together and discuss techniques, the exhibit work. It's just, it's this mm -hmm. huge plethora of information. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we were in Portland two years ago and Nikki, yeah. we were, yeah. 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 About it. Well, there was just a, there's, there were lots of different cup shows, lots of different, you know, me shows. And I was just talking out loud and I was like, you know, me, you know me, right. you know, and I started to think about this play on words, you know, just sort of taking a, an interesting, you know, foreign word and sort of trying to recontextualize it. And so we started saying to each other, you know me, and it was really kind of like a eureka moment for both of us because um, taking this vessel, this vessel, yeah. this, this idea of this thing that historically is made by like an anonymous potter, um, a, a Japanese potter in Japan. We'll, t we'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute, but, um, and then kind of thinking about it as internal and personal through that, um, discourse and sort of through that changing and investigating the word, breaking it down. So that's kind of like where the concept came from. Mm -hmm. You know, really it was just more fun and play on words and sort of thinking about this, right. but it developed, yeah. So. And, so, and so from there, that's when we approached Craft in mm -hmm. America. We were like, okay, you know, how, where can we take this idea, this mm -hmm. concept? And so we came to the center and they seemed, you know, really excited about our idea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, simultaneously, you know, there was also some conversation with Jeff Ostrike mm -hmm. about, our show, like this idea of the you know me, and Jeff got really excited and was like, do you know, like, this is the 100 year anniversary right now of St. Ives, um, which is Bernard Leach's, you know, school. Yeah. And just to backtrack, uh, Jeff Ostrick is an exhibiting artist in our yes. show, and also a organizer, an of organizer of the humble legacy and um, a, a pillar of uh, wealth of information of American craft as a ceramicist. So he's a big icon in our field. And, you know, he kind of had this idea going on about celebrating the 100th anniversary of St. Ives um, and also excited about our You Know Me mm -hmm. show. Yeah. So he's quite yeah. a You Know Me maker. Yeah. And so this, so these two ideas, these two shows kind of came together in this, you know, this pairing, which has been really lovely. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, we, we really felt like the title, You Know Me, didn't really serve us anymore. Mm -hmm. And it made a lot more sense in conjunction with the humble legacy to kind of talk about where we are between legacy and now, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's really where we came into like here now and those contemporary narratives and the idea and the, you know, of what the you know me mm -hmm. is today. And, and, you know, so let's talk a little bit about that. Like, yeah, you know, as far as, well, the individualism, right? Yeah. Well, it's the individualism because when we kind of talk about, you know, the, you know me, it's a Japanese cylindrical vessel that's often used um, just for, you know, everyday drinking. Um, and these artists that we have here, 
you know, they still are like working within the framework and the concept of like, you know me, um, but very individually, you know, it's, it's become like their voices through this. So we have different images here of people in the show, Jeff Ostrich, Kevin Snakes, uh, Shoko Teriyama, Amy Smith. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so and even in, in rooted in that is also this idea of, you know, Jeff, and for any of you who were able to, to go to the last talk about the humble legacy with, mm -hmm. with, with Jeff, he he really said something that resonated with both Nikki and I, mm -hmm. which is, you know, we as Americans are not locked in cultural tradition traditions. And so all of these artists have this ability. Um, that we've selected and others um, to kind of transcend beyond that. Yeah. So, so like talking about the trend of of, mm -hmm. of the you know me, right? So, Nick and I, you know, again, like a, a lot of these artists uh, are traditionally trained. Where we are, like, so first and foremost, we are not art historians. Mm -hmm. We are artists and educators. Um, and his art history has been is very important to us. But it, it, at the root of that, you know, we didn't we did not we're not trained taught to be tape making you know me you know me is something that has really been more of a trend i yeah. think in the last 15 years 13 years, years. so yeah. we, we were classically trained but we learned how to make tea bowls or tumblers or right? tumblers yeah. a lot of things from like you know Bauhaus, um you know origins and our is, was our, our aesthetic or sort of our method of teaching being taught um but there is this plethora of you know me shows and they're great because they're cups and they're beautiful mm -hmm. and you get to see um, a variety of different artists and their work and how they approach this form and one thing that artists talk a lot about ceramic artists are the cups are for potters in a sense it's like the the thing that we give each other the thing that we purchase the thing that we like to collect we collect tons of you know me um so that was like a, a, a big thought that we had towards that. No. And so not only that, but the, no. the clay of car, you know, we really, we want to kind of yeah. emphasize the fact that they, this, this gallery has had these 13 years of this yeah. amazing annual show where they represent over 200 artists. And mm -hmm. because of that, it has really, you know, me has now become a common day, you know, a mm -hmm. common practice word that we're using within our vocabulary as a maker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really wanted to pay tribute to that in, in that conversation. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So right. we've got Jeff's image here. So, and we just kind of wanted to state because Jeff said something so awesome in the last lecture, which was basically that as Americans who have taken the idea of this, this cup, the idea of this Tebow, this idea of a you know me, um, that we're not locked in tr into tradition. And that, you know, he said, basically, as a nation of immigrants, and we get to enjoy and embrace all these cultural identities and reinterpret them. And so it's been a really, um, that was a really important quote to us when we were talking about his work. Here's his sake cup which is such a great cup with the high heel on it. So he's kind of recontextualized uh, an important historical form. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, so getting beyond that, so there's our concept. Um, and now we kind of want to talk about, you know, cause probably a lot of people are sitting here going like, what is a you know me? Mm -hmm. What makes it different than a T-bowl? Mm -hmm. You know, so we really kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that. So within, again, the concept of the show, um, we really wanted to engulf ourselves in kind of like, what is a you know me? What is it used for? And so within our kind of research, we discovered that the differences between a you know me and a tea ball are, are the fact that a, a you know me is a cupboard cup, is a cup, it's a daily user, mm -hmm. something that when you open up your cabinet, you use it, you don't overthink it. It's not a precious object. It's something that you you, you cultivate to in your daily practice. Mm -hmm. And it's very cylindrical in form, you know, taller than it is wide, and it has a slight tapered foot, which is very different than a Japanese tea bowl. A Japanese tea bowl um, is much more, it's like, it's not the covered cup. It, it's put in the special location yeah. in your home. And it's, it's ceremonial. For, for ceremony. For yeah. ceremony. And it's, it's very precious. And so we really want to give that distinction between the two. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you want to add to that? No, it's just the idea of like that, everyday use, that cupboard cup kind of idea um, that is really appealing to us and we'll explain why. Um, because 
when we started researching the Unomi, we came across this practice in Japanese culture of giving a set of Unomi called a Miyoto Unomi, which is um, basically the, uh, the Miyoto means like married pair. Um, and the, the practice of giving uh, a set of these to a newlywed couple was really intriguing because one is generally larger than the other, representing the husband and the wife. When we started researching that, it was like, oh my gosh, the intent and the idea and what we can plug into and the transference of concept and idea through the Miyoto Yunomi was really, really exciting. Um, here's an example of Miyoto Yunomi, uh, smaller. Traditional. Right? Traditional, larger. Mm -hmm. um, and if I move forward here. Yeah, let's do it. Oops, I never know which one to press. Yeah. So this is a total sort of, you know, transference of this idea. This is Ashley Bevington. This is her uh, uh, Miyoto uh, Yunomi set called Puppy Love. The male, if I can move my cursor, is here. And this is a side view. And this is the female. The male in this case is a little bit smaller than the female. But she has to make room to sort of have these, you know, Ashley's idea within this, and let me go back to my notes here really quickly, um, is for her, this cup set really sort of represents a specific story. And this story for her is that, what kind of could have happened to her if she had gone down a path uh, that a lot of her acquaintances had gone down early on if she had not chosen art and education over other things. Ashley grew up in rural Ohio. She grew up hunting. She grew up um, breeding Rottweilers and having this real rural experience. And, but who she was, was really an artist. So when she started thinking about the Miyoto Yunomi and the implications of gender and marriage behind the Miyoto Yunomi, this is what resulted. So you've got the male figure, okay, and you've got his sort of red rocket here holding the key to her like empty cave brain, okay, and there's the key, the keyhole. He's got her brain on his tongue. And these, um, Talk you know me. Of yeah. And the, these, you know me are actually, you know, there's a nice picture of them actually on the craft in America website. So you can see them full on. Um, the backside of this is this is the backside of this form, the female, you can see that it has, you know, multiple like breasts yeah, in like it. Lactating. Lactating. Te teats, yeah. Teats. And basically the idea of this in Ashley's quotes is that this creature is born to breed. So this is how she interpreted the idea of the Miyoto Yunome. Um, and then with, she, with her other sets here, um, you know, they start to become very gendered with uh, pink and blue. And you can see here that these have uh, lots of little flowers, but not as many as the, as the couple before and that the green and yellow poodle you know me do not have any flowers on them. So these flowers sort of represent little pops of enlightenment. The younger ones and the youngest ones don't have them. As they move through maturity, they get more and more flowers, moments of enlightenment. And just to wrap it up, the poodle is very much Ashley's sort of, um, it's sort of like her metaphor. So they were bred as hunting dogs and now they're this metaphor for wealth and culture. She loves to poke fun of that. She loves to outline her figures in like black, you know, just like 90s cartoons that really inspire her. And they have these sort of dopey wide-eyed, um, you know, uh, expressions on their faces, which is, you know, a hallmark of her work. Um, so now, I mean, before we launch into the rest of the artists, um, Nikki and I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about why we've selected the artists for this show. And um, so this was an invitational. So Nikki and I intentionally met with um, a lot of the artists in person, actually, 
Um, because it wasn't just like, oh, send us your, your best cups and you know me. Mm -hmm. It was more kind of like, we have this really interesting concept, this loaded launching pad of, of these vessels to talk about this mm -hmm. larger construct, this larger idea. And it was really a way to get people kind of pushing their own kind of ideas and concepts. And um, mm -hmm. so when we met with everyone, it was just like, yeah, this is great. This is a, a fantastic idea. And they mm -hmm. just kind of like lit up and was like, yeah, this is mm -hmm. more of what I want. Yeah, it's and next level. Yeah, right? next level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, concept craft. Mm -hmm. And um, and in doing so, um, Nick and I really sat down and we're like, okay, why did we pick these people? And it mm -hmm. really has to do with the fact that these artists are very strong. All of these artists' works really stand on their own. Mm -hmm. You do, you can aesthetically, when you see a meth body of work or a single piece alone, you know that it's hers. Yeah. And the same goes for all of these artists, like Shoko's work mm -hmm. and Amy Smith. I mean, you, it's very specific and it's very, you know, yeah. signified. And it's individual, yeah. you know, just like kind of within our concept right. that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so next, um, so going into uh, the next artist, um, we're going to talk about Kevin Snipes. So Kevin Snipes, um, as one of the artists that we selected um, for his deeply rooted conceptual mm -hmm. means of his work. He's a very, very heavy thinker. Um, and I really enjoyed discovering the deeper understandings of his work and my conversations mm -hmm. with him, which were quite elaborate and, <laughs> um, and it, it very exciting to see. Um, so his pieces, you have these four pieces here, and these are not pairs in, the, in, in as far as the vessels sitting next to each other, they are individual pieces. And those individual cups actually create a duality within the panels because you can see that they're kind of these loose squares. And in those loose squares, there is an image in each panel, mm. right? That he's kind of put into the pieces. And so those, those individual pieces come become meoto, meaning pairs within themselves. And so those concepts, those ideas of otherness. So, uh, Kevin really kind of likes the idea that his work is rooted in magical realism in the sense that the work is, is about his experiences, his memories, his ideas, but he does not want the work to be taken literally. Mm -hmm. He wants the viewer to come into the work and bring their own ideas, their own sense of childhood wonderment, their own experiences and create their own narratives, right? But yet still have this otherness encompassing each of these panels so that it's one story, one idea, but nothing's really exactly connecting, right? Yeah. They're like binaries yeah. in each individual form. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he builds these, they're all hand built, um, and he makes them out of porcelain. Porcelain is such a loaded material in itself with mm -hmm. glass and stature. Um, and he leaves the figures themselves. So I'm going to go to the next one. I might go back and forth. Um, he leaves the figures that he draws on here as the original clay color underneath. Um, and so that is white. Um, but it's intentional in the sense that he wants to create this ambiguous kind of re like response to the work because people come to him and say, why are you, why are you putting white people on your work? Why are you putting Asian people on your work? Oh, they're clearly African American, right? And he is an African American artist and he, his work is, is really rooted in, um, the history of colonialism mm. and in patriarchy and linguistics and yeah. yeah and and so you know that all being said you know he puts these images and these pieces on there because he wants this idea of otherness to be interpreted right mm. so so that he doesn't want it to be just very clearly like african american figures on the pieces he wants the the viewer to approach the work mm -hmm. the way that they approach it so when he works on these pieces he hand builds them he then uses um under glazes to draw and to decorate and scraffito um and mishima which is like mm -hmm. an inlay technique onto the forms and he calls it a tattooing he tattoos the skins of these vessels as he's working in, in them um kevin's background um is He's well versed in both drawing and in ceramics, but he really is like secretly and quietly a painter. Um, and we talked about that some, I'm like, you should jump in, like just start painting. And, yeah. and, and so, um, but that all being said, you know, the work is, is really, you know, kind of this otherness and yeah. ties between gender and ethnicity, mm. um, you know, and, and in, 
his concepts, his ideas about his work. He really is talking a lot about the power of language. And we had this really interesting conversation when we talked about his work about if things were flipped, if African descended peoples were um, colonials, mm -hmm. right? And they took the power of language in themselves instead of calling themselves black, they were gold and that they were the golden people yeah. and that they took away the construct and the idea of white and yeah. whiteness and purity. And, and, and then we have to, and he really pointed out that through history, African descended people have been called many different things, mm. but Eurocentrics have always it's claimed white. white. Mm. And that what if that was taken away? What if, what if Caucasian people were referred to as pink, right? Where would power is held in the word pink? And so I thought that was a really interesting conversation. And I think it also roots back to his ideas and mm -hmm. his like magical realism that he kind of transposes onto the pieces of, of his work. Um, and, you know, uh, it's a really common form that he uses in his pieces. He does not put handles on them because he doesn't want that disconnect. He wants them to be embraced because it's the invitation. It's a drinking vessel. It's yeah. approachable. And you need to look at all the and, sides right. of it because yeah. all the sides are really important and he, for him. Yeah. And he really wants yeah. to kind of pull you in. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I want to say, because there's a lot to say about him, um, and if you have any yeah. questions, we can talk about it, is this idea of Kevin has most recently moved from Philadelphia, like from rural artists and residencies all over the country to purposely move to Philadelphia to be in a diverse urban space because his work and the concepts of his work will thrive better in those environments. And his work again has always been rooted in these ideas about racism and um, otherness and disconnect. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's always been, been undertoned or like kind of like hushed down, but with the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020, he's hoping for more of a overt kind yeah. of response mm -hmm. and an awakening in the audience with his work. Oh, Amy. Okay. So this is Amy Smith's work. Um, these lovely pieces are um, porcelain. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about um, how they're made. Um, they're thrown on the wheel and altered um, in this beautiful icy white, white porcelain. Um, Amy incises her work. I think she uses a, a, an X-Acto blade to do it and inlays the, the porcelain with like a black underglaze, some type of black on go black slip. And then um, glazes them in very fluid glazes. So her work is extremely reminiscent of water freezing and thawing and melting. So you get that pull, that real luscious feeling, which uh, fits the, the forms very much so of, of her pieces. Um, uh, let's see. Um, she intuitively alters each you know me to relate innately to the figure. So cutting a foot for her is like a method of connecting uh, the ankle to like a knuckle, um, stretching the clay to suggest skin over bone. Um, she uses unctuous white uh, porcelain and that's a very important sort of like detail for her is making the porcelain really stretch to feel like a body, you know, a body movement. Um, and she has always sort of really looked and studied the female figure um, to map sort of the topography of the cup to the female form. Um, holding them is really interesting. I think that I didn't really understand her work until I was able to hold one myself for the first time. Um, a friend of mine also purchased one uh, recently on his own, and we kind of talked about the hand feel, which is really important to Amy when she's making these works, because you pick them up, and I think a lot of artists think about how they're going to put their hands around the cups and, you know, how they're held. These have a weight to them, and I think what that weight is like the stature that comes with her pieces. Um, the cup is a very intimate object to her. Uh, it goes to your mouth, you touch it. It's very, um, you know, a very sensual thing. She loves the female figure for its sensuality, for its absolute beauty. Um, and then you can see that her level of 
of detail and her level of skill in drawing the figure, the female form is really, really great. And, you know, putting these female figures onto these eunomies just elevate them in their, in their stature. So they're, they're just really great. So I have to, I have to answer Alex. <laughs> um, okay. Moving on to Liz, uh, pick a check. Um, and okay talking a little bit about her work. So this is an installation shot mm -hmm. of her pieces. So these are the five you know me that she made specifically uh, for the show. And you can see from this, it's a little bit, and I'm gonna zoom in in a minute with some, some more detail, um, but you know, Liz really approached this from a place of tradition. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. really wanted to honor the traditional form of the you know me. So you can see that again, it has that cylindrical wall. They do seem like da daily users, not super like delicate with that tapered mm -hmm. lovely foot that she puts on her pieces. Um, and you can also see that they are made and as the same size. So there is no signifier, there's no gender marker, which was very intentional for her, but she did want them to be um, traditionally made. She wanted to honor that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to just kind of zoom in here. Um, so looking at her pieces, um, we've got pink and green, you know, me pair here over on the right. And this is um, a reoccurring pattern that she puts on her pieces, um, a tectonic shift kind of design that she puts on them of lines kind of shifting from back and forth. Um, very beautifully done, highly designed. The motif is very, creates a lot of movement and gives you this amazing delight of mm -hmm. your senses yeah. as you you look at them you want to hold them in your hands you want to bring them to your lip um, they are very subtle in in color mm -hmm. in her pigments um, she leaves a raw exterior of the there's no glaze on the exteriors it's just all done with colored slips where she is you know inlaying and um, ad adding wax and applying these slips at very intricate mm -hmm. detail right um, they're coil built. So she coils her pieces um, very, very methodically mm -hmm. in the sense that she takes like a slab of porcelain. And in this case, we also have stoneware of a dark stoneware mm -hmm. type. And she builds this beautiful slab and kind of pushes the clay out and then starts to build the walls up using a banding wheel, much like you would a potter's wheel. And it was a technique that she learned from her professor in school, Crystal Boger. Um, and it was really important. This is a, this process is really important to her. Mm. She makes these pieces simultaneously mm. side by side as they're working up the form. So the pairs are really bonded mm. and you can see that in their making. Um, they are um, over here to the porcelain dot gradation. Um, you can see that even though they are opposing as far as motif, so you can see that they have the opposites, they do seem like they belong together. Yeah, paired. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you just get this, again, this like value to the pieces. And that's something that Liz really kind of talks a lot about. She's like, I want to create value to my pieces. Um, and because clay itself is not as very, very kind of a lowly material, it's just mud, right? And so many different people have, have, have commented about like, oh, it's just mud. But if it's what you put into it that gives it its value. And so she really wants to, and when we talk value, mm -hmm. we're not talking monetary, we're talking about that that use well that thing that, that, that thing, thing theory and think you know this idea of something transcending beyond yeah. its monetary or its function yeah like these become precious and she wants that to mm -hmm. to exist in her work um so as uh i really want to point out before we move forward which is She's an art history um, holder as far as a degree. So she has a, a BFA as well as a BA in art history. And so she really has this larger vocabulary or catalog, catalog of understanding of, of where she fits into the art world mm -hmm. and, and the plethora of like different art that she's, she is um, able to exist in. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Oh, I wanted to do like one quick little quote for her and then we're gonna move forward. My Yonomi series is based around formal contrast, like shape, I mean, excuse me, sharp versus soft, silver versus gold, mm. and straight versus round. I like how these juxtapos <laughs> juxtapositions on similar forms echo the feminine or the masculine that is traditional in the husband slash wife style of the Mayoto, but are less specifically gendered. It is also lets me play with the formal proportions and design elements that are characteristic to my work. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Thank you, Liz. Oh, Jeff, yay. Okay, so um, 
this is Jeff Ostrick's work and he um, uh, organized the Humble Legacy show as well. Um, and we thought it would be just so important to include him in the show um, because he has some very uh, subtle um, implications in his work that fit with the concept uh, very completely. Um, a little bit about Jeff is um, he's a lo located in Minnesota um, and he apprenticed with Warren McKenzie in the 60s. Um, and he was taken with uh, Mackenzie's lifestyle, his home, and it sort of created this awakening within him. He uh, met with Warren Mackenzie during a workshop in high school. Um, so from there, he also um, apprenticed in St. Ives with Bernard Leach, um, and then came back and established his studio. So his work is, as you can see, very architectural. He has a lot of influences from art deco architecture after doing a workshop in um, New Zealand in, uh, oh, I wrote it down, Napier Village. He, that has a historical art deco, has a historical art deco um, downtown. Um, and he just loved those buildings. He loves the DuPont and Glen Sheen mansions and all of that green art, um, like art deco tile um, and arts and crafts movement green tile. But one of the things that I want to talk mostly about his work is that, you know, he is a consummate you know me maker. And basically the thing that he's worked on is his quest, he says, is to bring more meaning into the you know me. Um, how can he do that? How can he increase the significance of this object, which is small and packet full of meaning? One of the ways that he does this is because these little subtle details that you see on his you know me, especially the images on the right, um, they mean things, they have suggestions. So Jeff will often make sprig molds of antidepressant pills. Um, He'll include something like high heels on his you know me because he has a high heel collection. And one important factor to his you know me, which I don't think a lot of people know, is that the triangle image, which is really prevalent on a lot of his work, mm -hmm. um, comes from the triangle patch that was on prisoners clothing um, and was used by the Nazis as a symbol for homosexuals. As a gay man, he really, um, recontextualizes that, triang that triangle image into his work to gain significance. He also uses buttons, historical buttons, um, things that honor people, mementos from friends and family in his work. And that's how he addresses the surface of them to give them meaning and to pack them full of meaning. Okay, Candace Meth. Um, Candace Meth, uh, so these are these are her uh, mayoto pairs. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Barry going in a different direction here. Um, so she breaks away from tradition, you know, radically, right? Mm -hmm. And um, which is lovely done and really kind of moves us into a different conversation mm -hmm. completely, right? And so this is um, a copy of two pair. I mean, two pairs. She she sent in five. And when we look at these images, we really start to create this connection, right? This, this idea of transposing the vessel as in our minds, like a, a of our, of the human body mm -hmm. and those connection, those, that, that energy between those vessels. And when we look over to the right and pair number three, you know, you have this kind of tripod standing arching figure that's very strong next to this very curved, delicate, vulnerable yeah. mm -hmm. vessel that does not have a foot that can easily fall or move. And so it creates this kind of like dialogue um, of characteristics between these pieces and th also the way that she pl places them or we as the viewer places them, having them placed moving, looking away mm -hmm. from its mate defines a certain kind of connection versus it facing towards mm. it, which is more embracing, right? So again, creating these different levels of complexity. Mm. And then we look over to the right also, you know, 
we have these two vessels that are very di different in one is very tall. We've got these curvilinear mm. kind of voluptuous base. And then again, this very uh, vertical with this stature and these kind of spikes kind of sticking out and the, that kind of relationship between the two. So when Candace was making these pieces, she wasn't really interested in like the tr tradition, but she was really in, or even thinking about husband and wife or male mm -hmm. or female, she was thinking about eth ethnicity, right? This origin of place and where we as the viewer, where these pieces take us mm -hmm. to this place in our minds. And so, you know, when you look at her work and one of the reasons why we selected her is her work is so rooted in ancient mm -hmm. vessels. Like you look at these and you see ancient mm -hmm. or primitive architecture or, you know, ceremonial vessels, yeah. even the way she makes them. She coil builds these forms. And I want to just point out that Candace was traditionally trained as a, a production potter. She was a production potter for 10 years making this, um, you know, and not to put down the production no. pottery, but for her, it was monotonous. It was just, you know, the same thing, just pulling it out. And for her, it was really refreshing to go to graduate school, to have this experience and to redefine herself into making these one of a kind pinch pot forms that are very delicate and shows her, her, um, mm -hmm her process. Um, she uses terra sigillatas, which are also a very ancient process um, um, as well. So uh, looking at another set of her pieces, um, you can see here the idea of past like submission versus aggressive kind of relationships between the forms. So over here looking at pair number two, five, four, sorry about that, four. Um, <laughs> we have this very voluptuous, very curvy, curvy kind of delicate form yeah. in, in uh, juxtaposed to this spiky kind of almost, you know. Brutalistic yeah, form. This yeah, this form, right? And so, you know, kind of having those conversation those and, and those ideas. Um, so for Liz, um, you know, she, not Liz, excuse me, Candace, um, she was traditionally, um, not traditionally, yeah, traditionally in her family, her father is a World War II vet and um, he didn't put a lot of emphasis on education. And for her, um, it, art, yeah, they mm -hmm. moved like 13 times before mm -hmm. she graduated high school. She didn't really have this like sense of place or home. And she, she feels deeply connected to ancient cultures that have not nomadic practices, but are very connected to the land that they live, you know, lived and existed in. And that is the work that really drives her mm -hmm. in her in her pieces. And so when she goes into a museum or or at the same time and juxtaposed to that, she's also interested in nature. Like she's collected, you know, for 10 years, uh, different kinds of lichen and how those different types of lichen have feed, fed back into her work and her ideas and her textures and her colors. So it's mm. when she's not working in studio, she's in a museum. If she's not in a museum, she's in nature. She's and these are these are the ways that she exists in this very introverted life mm. that she makes these beautiful pieces. Um, so a uh, few of the artists um, were, we were blessed to have them send out some larger pieces. So these are some window displays that we have up in the gallery. And so these are some of Candace's larger work um, that really give, shows the full girth of her, her practice, um, and, but definitely falls back into her concepts of the you know me ideas. Um, these are um, over to the, to the left, a vessel. This is a storage jar. So, um, so for, for Candace, her work, even though it's not meant to be used every day or maybe ever, she really has to have them be functional. And it's really part of her blue collar upbringing. She, it's like, it's so a part of her concept and her idea that even though they're probably not gonna be used, they still have to be able mm -hmm. to be used. And um, so these really beautiful storage jars. And so up at the top of these, these are lids um, that kind of come off and they actually can hold, you know, some kind of substance inside. Over here, this is a, um, it's called Two Fawns, um, which is a, uh, she was inspired by an Anasazi vessel that actually has two headed, it's a two headed vessel. Um, and so these tops, which are these little fawn heads, literally are jar lids that kind of open yeah. up so you can use it. And so for her, she was inspired by um, two fawns that she watched be born and grew up in her backyard in Red Lodge, Montana right now. Mm. Um, so, you know, giving a little insight to some of her work. Oh, okay. So here's Shoko's work. Um, and I'm going to try and go quick because I know we're 
we're, we're going. Um, but basically, Shoko Teriyama's work is, these are just really lovely, delicate, small vessels. As you can see, they're three by three by four. Um, and it's, her work is generally, you know, she, she kind of ex explains it as it goes in, you know, one of two directions. Uh, she looks to make things highly decorative, a lot of ornamentation, or she will put a lot of narrative into the work. Often those lanes intersect where there's ornamentation in and around the narrative on the pieces. Um, but she makes a lot of calculated decisions um, about how to approach the surface of the work. Sometimes she'll set things aside for long periods of time and revisit them until the feeling is right for these forms. Um, within this exhibition, uh, she really wanted to talk about this world building. Um, and hopefully I say this right. So Shoko grew up in Mishima, uh, she, um, oh, let me write it. Let me find my notes here. Um, in the, oh, I'm, I'm all over the place here. Okay, here we are. Sorry, guys. Um, Shizuka Prefecture, and she, which is a, uh, like roughly 60 miles southwest of Tokyo, as, as she told me, um, her school groups would often field trip to the local Buddhist shrines and temples. They bring sketchbooks and draw um, in those shrines and temples. So she was very steeped in these traditional areas, these traditional pieces of architecture. Um, also, when she's making the work, Shoko likes to use animals to convey the narrative. Um, the animals for her are not necessarily gendered. Um, the animals kind of uh, tell the story much easier for her than if she was putting figures into her work and to these pieces. Um, she feels like the animals can be very relatable to people so they can invest themselves in the process of understanding the narrative. That's really important to Shoko is that she doesn't necessarily want to tell the story for the person. They have to do the work to decipher it or create their own narrative within the work. Um, animals are often like, if I go back here, um, you know, some of them are right side up, some of them are upside down. So Shoko is really interested in these mirror worlds, um, the world where everything's on the straight and narrow, going really well, and then on the, uh, in the world where everything sort of goes topsy-turvy and you're flipping over on yourself. Um, where things go wrong as with life, but also, you know, with these kind of poignant animals that have a lot of um, quirkiness to them as well. Um, so within that sort of mirror world where things are flipped upside down, um, she's trying to convey this message, but she wants you to do the work for it. So here with the, this rainbow piece, these rainbows are on the backside of the cat. And motherhood has really changed the way she thinks and it's informed her work recently. Uh, cats are sort of the stand in for children. Rainbows are things that all cats really love. Um, flipping them upside down. But one thing that I wanna point out here with, with uh, her work is her, her beautiful like name carved into the piece, which is in very stark contrast right. to the uh, anonymous, anonymous Japanese potter, you know, that, you know, is just very quiet, doesn't using have a, a chuck, right? using a chop, something like that. But Shoko really showcases her name and owns these, these worlds, if you will. So, yeah. Um, and then our last artist um, that we really want to talk about is Leslie uh, McNilly. Um, so Leslie's background is, um, she is a Scottish artist mm -hmm. um, who immigrated to Canada. So she is actually still a Scottish citizen, um, but she has become a resident of, of Canada. Canada. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so she lives um, and works and has really kind of redefined herself as an artist after she mm -hmm. moved to Canada. And she's spent a long time learning 
how to create this kind of elaborate surface decoration on her pieces. Um, she uses lots and lots of different colored slips mm -hmm. um, that, you know, yes, yeah. she just layers them and layers them and layers them and then mm -hmm. sands them after they've been fired and adds oxides mm -hmm. and then fires them again to really create this like very dense eroded like surface and the pieces really start to get this sense of an abstract landscape mm -hmm. um, that you kind of feel working around the forms uh she went to the dundee university in scotland in dundee scotland and her degree is not is is, is very design based so all of the marks that you see here are just not loosely just kind of happenstance she really is intentionally putting each of her colors and her shapes as abstract as they are where they belong and if you can see looking at her forms these red dots and these red dots have become such a significant marker for her pieces mm -hmm. that they do not seem finished to her or her audience without them it becomes such a focal point that pulls you in and finishes the pieces um so first and foremost i want to talk about the, the kind of concept of her work in the sense that the main root of her work is that she is deeply passionate about studying ancient man-made structures, mm -hmm. right? So going to ruins, um, vol 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 being at home yeah. in Scotland and traveling, um, with less so in the United States, of course, but um, to be able to see these ancient ruins and to kind of see how nature has kind of retaken these ancient spaces and that kind of transformation yeah. and then again the next nuance on that is the the kind of popular culture of graffiti right that also encompass a lot of mm -hmm. these spaces and it makes me think of like my travels to Greece you know seeing these beautiful ruins, ruins and then yeah. graffiti beautiful murals on the walls like graffiti to over these yeah. ancient things and, and then also yeah. like you can see nature kind of coming in as well mm -hmm. and breaking them down so you can really see that in the work so that's really the root of mm -hmm. her of her concepts and then um you know nature um, no, not nature, that um, the pieces are called emotional landscapes, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. she, this series of work is emotional landscapes and the emotional landscape work um, encompasses all of these really bright colors to kind of evoke that emotion mm -hmm. in the York. Cause she's really gone through this huge transition um, in the last three years as a life cycle. Um, and specifically the, this body for the you know me, she wanted to create um, instead of it being about the male man and uh, husband and wife, it was really about daughter and mother, the relationship between the two and her creating these power mantras, these words. So what she's doing is she is, um, she's trained both in printmaking as well as in ceramics. She is putting these layered slips using chalks to to uh, like she's doing mono prints mm -hmm. onto paper and then transposing them with text onto the pieces, which causes them to go into reverse. And then in, in that reversal, looking at these images that um, you know that it's text, but it's not decipherable. The intention is for the viewer to hold them, to embrace them, and then to look into a mirror to see the, the correct kind of Text, the text, the text yeah. kind of coming through. And then that mantra is then being held by the viewer who then becomes a self-portrait through the mirror and then the power of the word, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this like this play on all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, her having all of those, those kinds of ideas kind of coming together with the work and they are still functional, even though her work is, is she defines herself as a sculptural vessel maker there is a glossy vitreous glaze on the inside that allows it to be functional, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and then again, so, so here are some of her um, landscape series vessels mm -hmm. that are not part of the You Know Me, but um, but she kind of encompass that, that same idea and you can see the red dot here and then also the black oxide that really creates that nice contrast that it pops out those um, colored stains. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to point out too is that these aren't necessarily you know me. Just like um, Candace Mess large sculptural pieces are in the window, um, a lot of artists use the you know me, use a cup as a launching point for uh, different vessels or ideas. A lot of them use them as quick sketches. We don't know for sure if that was Leslie and Candace's intention, but it does happen a lot. In, in with the making of things. So 
that concludes our, our lecture. And if yeah. anybody has questions yeah. or. So at this point, I think we're thinking that we're going to have Alex on yeah. standby. And I know for we've run, questions. we've run over. We had so much, but that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> Hopefully you guys will stick with us. Um, so let's see some of, uh, the questions. Let's okay. see. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Great. Anybody have a question for us? Do we, we, do we say lots of great things? Do we say enough? Are you guys tired of hearing us? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, so Alex is there on standby inside the gallery too, if anybody wants to see it in, in live. Oh, uh, do each of you have your own favorite, you know me, um, um, that we own or that it is in the show? In the show, probably. Ooh, I don't think I want to share that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we share that, it'll get snatched up. Um, so I think that, should we pin this one right here, Katie? Sure, we, yeah, let's pin it. How do we, how do, we do that to yeah, make right that here. the main? here spotlight video right there we go okay right, there we go alex. so alex is heading over to amy smith and you can kind of see you the know, work all together. i feel like any of the um the uh, you know we we're so invested in all of these artists that any of these pieces i would gladly just tuck into my tuck into my purse and like why well, no i didn't say that but um i think some of the ones really after hearing and investigating um kevin snipes work um man it's it's such a loaded vessel i would love one of his pieces it's one of some of my favorite things i love ashley bevington's puppy love the amount of craft and detail in those is is really quite astounding this is kevin's work here so it looks like we're getting some, uh, so first off, somebody, uh, Renee, uh, at, said, I wish you wouldn't be so rushed. Um, so to, to um, give you guys a little feedback on that, so, you know, we're trying to keep it within an hour because um, thank you so much for your time. It means so much to us, but there will be a catalog with all of our curatorial, yeah, yeah, with thoughts, our, cura with our, curator writing, with our yeah. curatorial mm -hmm. um, write-ups that are very elaborate and get into each artist's work as well as images. So if that's something you're interested in, please um, stay tuned. Um, mm -hmm. And that will also be virtually available um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so for anybody who's feeling like you're gonna kind of got cut short. Yeah. Um, also, um, oh, there's, there's Jeff's work. So yeah, one thing Jeff I also want to add to is that if you go to the craft in America website, all of these, uh, pieces are here. They're all in stills, you know, they're just images. And then of course, all these artists have Instagram pages. Many of them have websites for you to look at their work and then investigate their work and their concepts um, further. So, and so Mel is asking to deconstruct Mac McNilly and Meth's work and process. So if looking at McNilly's pieces, so what she's doing is she hand builds, oh, Alex, we go back to McNilly. <laughs> Thank you. So Don't but, anybody get yeah. sick. <laughs> so, so, um, so for Mel, uh, McNilly, what she does is she, she throws these forms. Um, and she also makes really large vessels that she actually hand builds, um, with paper clay. Mm -hmm. So these are thrown pieces. The smaller pieces are, are thrown and she does not trim them on a wheel. She actually uses a rasp mm -hmm. for, so she hand rasps the bottoms of the vessels. And then she has all of these really elaborate stains, uh, slips, porcelain slips that she applies to the pieces in different thicknesses. So some are thin slips, some are really thick slips. Mm -hmm. And so you can start to see that kind of layering and that buildup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after that's done. And so I want to also point out that both Liz and um, Liz and um, Leslie McNilly, neither of you, them use scales when they weigh out their stains and their work, which I found really fascinating because they really are working from an empirical place yeah. that they're working just very instinctually to like get the color they mm -hmm. want. And I find that so refreshing because we're so we rooted in so science. trained to be like measuring everything but scientifically I, but I, through that process. But yeah. I do also secretly in my own studio when I'm mixing up stuff, I'm uh -huh. just like, I'm gonna do a little of this, a little, and it's really refreshing to see that be a little bit part of the conversation. So with her pieces, she then 
fires them once and then she takes sandpaper and she sands down the surfaces mm -hmm. because she wants to create a more of that eroded surface and to show the different layers of the work. Okay, so does the size difference of the gender you know me mean to fit together or stacked? Um, I think it really depends on the you know me, you know, in a traditional Mayoto you know me, this is from Grace. Um, I Hi, think Grace. they do, I think they do stack. Um, in our exhibition, not important. All that matters for them is that, you know, I'm sure that these beautiful Shoko pieces stack inside each other. Um, it's just the relationship between the two. It's the negative space they make within each other. Um, <clears throat> it's the conversation that they're having with each other. Um, but, you know, I have some Mayoto you know me that I like even collected myself over the years that I just have, oh, there we go. You know, they stack, I have them in my cupboard. Literally, these are my cupboard cups. So, you know, they're, they're there, they're in there, you know. Um, but maybe some of these ones like Liz's probably stack within. Yeah, within. definitely. Um, so Ben is asking, can we make an appointment to see the show? That is a good question. I think pre a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, it yeah. was by appointment. That yeah. is something we need to find out for you um, because yeah. I'm not sure with the certain ordinance, you know, with yeah, COVID we don't cases. Know for, with the, so with unfortunately, the this is Alex from Craft in America. Unfortunately, we're not legally allowed to have people inside the space. Um, so we do have a virtual exhibition up on the website right now. Yeah. Um, but definitely, I mean, I, I did post on Instagram a lovely view of Candace's pieces in the window that just, it's just breathtaking. I mean, you know, at least being able to poke your head in, actually in both shows, both Humble Legacy as well as the show, um, definitely I, it would be worth checking out. Oh God, we got a lot of questions yeah. here. Um, okay, uh, d uh, how do you hold them? You know, um, Carol, it just sort of depends with these, you know, um, I know that that was a question that you also had wondered, you know, in the previous lecture and from, from our research is that tea generally in Japan is not served at such hot temperatures as our beverages are in the Americas. Um, so oftentimes like, you know, me are, are held like this from, from what I understand, but it's not as hot, you know, that's why we have these Western handles and a lot of our pieces and a lot of our mugs that hold coffee. Um, with these vessels, I don't know if anybody would even drink out of them. That's not the intention necessarily. The intention is to have them speak to each other. Um, um, Jesse's asking, uh, did you guys know everyone in the work beforehand oh, yeah. or did you discover anybody? And we did, I mean, so Nikki and I, because we love to curate together and do mm -hmm. this, there's so many, we just have like, a plethora of like artists that we've kind of yeah we're like a mini catalog we're yeah. like a mini think tank we're yeah. always hanging out we're always thinking of new <laughs> things we're always like bouncing ideas off each other usually with like a glass of wine not this is not wine though by the way no it's just water but you know we do spend a lot of time talking and coming up with concepts and ideas um so so, so yeah karen fisher's asking mato pairs don't need to be gendered at no. all and exactly they don't you know yeah. like it's not necessary but yeah. I, I think that it's important to state that culturally it's a common signifier as a wedding gift yeah. in japan to give a larger and a smaller as a pair to symbolize male and female mm -hmm. but in a lot of places you know that's not necessarily no. the case within the show. Some of these are talking about motherhood and children. Kevin mm -hmm. Snipes' work, they're actually binaries. They're like two, like a, a pair and one almost, yeah. you know, in these terms of otherness and binary, so. But, um, but I, uh, I also want to just like plug in that this is not the end of our kind of discussion virtually. Yes. Um, we will be um, in the next few weeks interviewing um, several of our artists um, mm -hmm. in small, you know, 15 minute kind of interviews with each, each of them. So they said that would be a perfect opportunity for you guys to come back, plug back in with us yeah. and to get some of these technical questions you have or, you know, even just ask other questions um, outside of what we have to say. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, I also want to plug in that on September 12th, please put it into your calendar. Mm -hmm. um, we will be working with um, Jenny Sorkin. She's going to come in and we're going to have a discussion with her. And um, the title of that show is called The Loaded Vessel mm -hmm. and kind of this idea of the American individualism and our need to romanticize 
other cultures and their um, objects. Their objects. Yeah, and Jenny so Sorkin is a scholar who's a professor at UC Santa Barbara. Yeah, so, and, mm. and really somebody that we admire and adore as- um, As a voice of contemporary yeah, craft. craft. A, a yeah. critic, you yeah, know, so. So we're super excited. Um, that's the the 12th, uh, Ben, I think it's, I can't remember what time we Did set. Did we say what it's time It's on the it website. <laughs> We'll work it out. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Hi, Alan. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. That was such a fantastic talk. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that, was, that was great. That was just an, a perfectly an hour. Um, so yeah. And so if anyone has any other questions, you can always email us RSVP at craftinamerica.org. Um, and uh, people have been asking about purchasing. We're a museum. We don't sell the work. But we can put you in touch with the artists at the same email address, rsvp at craftingmark.org. Um, and thank you so much. And check back, sign up for our newsletters. Um, that's where we'll announce everything in our social media. So, and I just want to thank Nikki and Katie again. Thank for, you, Alex. Yeah. Thank well, you, Alex. Good day, everyone. Stay safe. Yeah. Right. Everyone be safe. Take care. <laughs> Bye, everybody.